Hello, and welcome to part three of our lecture series on the integumentary system, uh, essentially the skin. Uh, and in part three, what we're going to be looking at is going to be the dermis, or the connective tissue uh, component of the skin. Now, if we take a look at the dermis, again, what we're looking at is a structure that's going to be supportive of the overlying epidermis. And so, putting this into the context of what we've seen previously, the epidermis is going to be a stratified squamous, a maximally stratified, a maximally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And so, like we know with all other epithelia, our epidermis is going to be avascular. And so, it's going to be dependent upon oxygen and nutrients and materials diffusing up from the underlying connective tissue. And that's going to be that first region, the papillary layer uh, of the dermis. Uh, this is going to be uh, a loose connective tissue. We're going to have a lot of blood vessels within this. Um, and it's going to be supportive of the overlying connective tissue. Deeper to that, we're going to have the reticular layer of the dermis. Reticular because it looks like a reticulum. We've got this kind of coarse staining appearance because we've got a lot of collagen fibers, fibers kind of interwoven throughout this region, giving it a lot of strength and a lot of resistance to, to tugging and deformation in a lot of different orientations. And so we take a look at this. The dermis then is going to be supportive and anchoring the epidermis to other regions of the body, anchoring it to the hypodermis. Uh, in terms of thickness, the dermis can be anywhere up to about four millimeters in thickness. And so it's going to be much, much thicker than the stratified squamous uh, epidermis that we've looked at in the first two portions of this lecture series. Now, when we take a look at the epidermis, it's important to recognize that we're going to have what are referred to as epidermal ridges and dermal papillae. Uh, but you can think about these as essentially interdigitation or essentially like finger-like projections uh, in a three-dimensional way where the dermal papillae are going to be extensions of the dermis reaching up. The epidermal ridges are essentially going to be extensions of the epidermis, little fingers interdigitating going down, which are going to allow them to essentially almost uh, like a tongue and groove type orientation hook up with one another. And so Again, this is there for strength, because if we've got this interdigitation, it makes it give it some strength so that we're not uh, shifting the skin in relationship. We're not shifting the epidermis in relationship to the dermis, because that's going to damage it. It's going to interfere with the diffusion, because we're going to get some scar tissue forming. And that's important, because if we had a flat surface, we had a flat dermis and a flat epidermis sitting on top of it, there wouldn't be a whole lot of structure anchoring it together. And so if you were to brush up against something, you know, your upper dermis may keep moving where your dermis would stop. And we, in essence, cause a ripping uh, of the connection between our epidermis and our dermis. And so these dermal papillae and epidermal ridges are going to be important for this interdigitation and forming a good, stable connection between our epidermis and our dermis. Now, again, if we take a look at this at the microscopic level, at the essentially cellular level, we're going to see what we saw in other regions where we've got an epithelia sitting upon a basal lamina and then anchored through that basal lamina to the connective tissue underlying it. So we got that epidermal dermal connection giving us a lot of strength at that individual cell level. And again, we've got things like the hemidesmosomes uh, that are going to be those half desmosomes anchoring the bottom of the cell through the basal lamina into uh, anchoring filaments, anchoring fibrils into the connective tissue, the glycoproteins, which are then going to be hooked up to the collagens within the connective tissue, within the dermis. And so again, we've got that anchoring going on at the cellular level as well. Now, if we take a look at this again at the microscopic level, the integument, as we said earlier, is going to be comprised of two layers. I'm sorry, the, the dermis. The, the integument is the epidermis of the dermis, and we're lumping in the hypodermis, the fat level as well. We talked about the epidermis, the maximally keratinized stratified squamous part. Now we're focusing in on the dermis, the connective tissue part. And the dermis itself is composed of two layers. And so on this slide, you can hopefully at this point recognize the maximally keratinized stratified squamous part, the surface part. So you can see, you know, good region there, some kind of purplish staining. And then we've got the maximally keratinized cells uh, there along the top. Underlying the epidermis, where we go from kind of a purplish staining appearance 
to kind of an even pink staining appearance, this is going to be the papillary layer of the dermis. And this can be identified because we can see the dermal papillae interdigitated or in between these epidermal ridges, the kind of finger-like pushed down regions uh, of the epidermal tissues. We take a look at the staining appearance. It, it's pink, relatively even staining appearance because that's going to be a characteristic of a loose connective tissue. We've got connective tissue fibers, but they're going to be relatively thin, going to be interwoven, and kind of evenly distributed. If we go deeper than that, we're going to go deeper than that kind of even pink staining appearance, we can see kind of a more coarse staining appearance. We can see dark pink collagen bundles, but they're coarse, they're kind of interwoven, kind of irregular in their appearance, deeper within the dermis. And this is going to be the reticular layer of the dermis. And this is going to be comprised primarily of a dense irregular connective tissue where we're going to have thick collagen bundles, scattered uh, elastic fibers in between them. And it's going to be there again to provide strength to the dermis. So the Papillary layer is to support uh, the epidermis, keep it alive, blood vessels, diffusion, all of that stuff. The reticular layer is going to be there for strength, and strength in a lot of different orientations. So you can grab your skin and you can tug it and twist it and pull it, and you're not ripping it because you're essentially acting on that reticular layer of the dermis. Uh, the papillary layer is often going to be more cellular. Uh, we can see in some slides a lot of lymphocytes moving through that region. Uh, if we go down into the reticular layer, much less cells uh, and generally just primarily fibroblasts uh, down there at that point. If we start looking at some of the structures associated with the dermis, one of the most important ones are going to be the blood vessels. And so the blood vessels are going to be coming from the deeper regions of the body. They're going to come up to the skin and then ultimately they're going to go into a rich capillary bed within the papillary layer of the dermis, the layer within the dermal papillae and extensions like that, but immediately underneath the epidermis, immediately underneath the, the surface of the skin in essence. And so that's going to be good for the regulation of, of body temperature. And so if we're in a summer, uh, we're outside, we're exercising, it's hot, we tend to have kind of a reddish appearance to us. Uh, because, again, we think about the skin color that we talked about uh, before uh, with the oxyhemoglobin, the very red appearance, uh, is because we've got lots of capillaries close to the skin, lots of oxygen-rich blood close to the skin, and because of that, we're going to give a reddish hue or a flushed appearance to the skin. And that's good because it's delivering oxygen to the skin, but the circulatory system we talked about in one of the previous lectures is carrying heat as well as all of the other things within the, the body. And so by taking heat, putting it right there close to the skin, it can evaporate out. And so we're going to be looking at cooling, especially if we start to, to coat the body with sweat. And as that sweat evaporates, it's going to be pulling heat off, and the heat is being delivered by these uh, capillaries. Now, the opposite of that, instead of exercising out in the heat, we go out in the middle of January in Pennsylvania. We don't wear a coat. It's really cold out. And we take a look at ourselves. We're going to have kind of a pale staining appearance or even kind of a slightly kind of bluish staining appearance to our skin, even without staining. The reason for that is that the body wants to try to maintain the heat and conserve the heat. And so instead of taking the blood and putting it up into the capillaries right underneath the surface of the skin, where it can be evaporated out, where we can lose the heat, What's going to happen is arterial venous shunts or arterial venous anastomoses deeper within the dermis, down there within the reticular layer of the dermis, are going to open up so that blood comes up through an artery, it goes through essentially a bypass region, and then goes back down through a venule, and it stays at the deeper regions of the body. And so we're in essence bypassing the capillary, the capillary beds right underneath the epidermis. And so it has a paler staining appearance or a bluish staining appearance because you're not getting a lot of blood up into those regions. And so uh, we're conserving the, the, the heat of the body, trying to keep the blood near the body core, keep it, the heat uh, protected. But now our skin cells are going to be at risk of frostbite. They're going to be at risk because they're not getting oxygen, they're not getting nutrients, they're being essentially starved for that. So extensive periods of time like that can be very harmful to the skin because essentially we're bypassing the capillary beds, we're not delivering them with a reliable source uh, of oxygen, with the normal 
uh, flow of, of blood through them. We take a look at the nerve supply to the skin. As we said, again, this is going to be the skin as an interface between the body and the external world. We see lots of uh, receptors, to, um, sorry, lots of uh, nerves going to the skin, lots and lots of sensory receptors and nerves, everything from free nerve endings, which will be involved with discriminating pain and temperature, the Merkel cells that we talked about previously as an example of a fine touch receptor, uh, two specialized encapsulated sensory receptors that we'll talk about uh, in a couple minutes, Meissner's corpuscles, uh, which are low-frequency stimuli, essentially tactile, uh, Pacinian corpuscles, which are going to be good for pressure and vibration. Uh, we're going to have a limited postganglionic sympathetic nerves going to the skin, but in general, no parasympathetic innervation uh, to the skin itself. Now, as I said, we're going to talk about two encapsulated sensory receptors. The first are going to be the Meissner's corpuscles. The Meissner's corpuscles are going to be an encapsulated touch receptor. So they're encapsulated, meaning that they have this distinct structure associated with them. And so they've got uh, some anatomical um, kind of structure with them. They're going to be found within the dermal uh, ridges. And so they're going to be essentially in those dermal uh, up, up points, those interdigitations, within the fingers and the toes. And you can identify them because they're encapsulated, they're going to be uh, surrounded by modified swan cells, they're going to be organized in kind of a zigzag appearance. And you may not be able to see the cells, but you're going to be able to see that their nuclei are there in kind of a zigzag appearance. And again, these are going to be found in the fingertips and the toes, and they're going to be an example of a tactile receptor. The other example of an encapsulated receptor that we're going to look at are going to be the Pacinian corpuscles. And the Pacinian corpuscles are going to be found much deeper within the dermis normally deep within the reticular layer of the dermis or even extending down into the hypodermis itself, into the, the white fat that's underlying the skin. And these are, again, an encapsulated sensory receptor, and they're going to be formed by alternating layers of fibroblasts and thin collagen fibers. And they're going to look almost like you take an onion and you slice through it. And so you're going to have these layers of, of fibroblasts, and then you're going to have fluid in between those spaces. And what the Pacinian corpuscle is, is going to be a receptor that responds to pressure or vibration. And so it, in essence, moving the body is going to cause a movement of the fluid in those spaces between each of these layers. And that movement is going to activate the sensory receptor. So pressure, anything that pushes down enough to actually deform the Pacinian corpuscle is going to cause uh, the, the fluid to move as you're pushing it. You're going to push the fluid around within the structure or vibration. If you start oscillating uh, the skin or oscillating one of these structures, the fluid within these layers is going to be shifting back and forth. And that's going to be picked up by the sensory cells within these Pacinian corpuscles. And then now, going beyond the dermis, going to that deeper layer, we're going to get to the hypodermis. And again, to emphasize that Technically, the hypodermis is not actually part of the skin, but it just makes sense to include it here at this point because what we're looking at is going to be a connection between the integumentary system, essentially taking the dermis, and connecting it to the underlying layers. And so the hypodermis is going to be composed of a loose connective tissue and lots and lots of white adipose tissue. And so you can see that uh, in the slide over here because you've got that chicken wire appearance, some large blood vessels, Got some sweat glands, which we'll talk about uh, in the next series of lectures. Um, you got at least three good Pacinian corpuscles here. But you can see that it's in between that, that chicken wire appearance, which is the white fat, and that's going to be characteristic of the hypodermis. Flexibly binding the skin to the underlying tissues. If we take a look at the adipocytes, the number of adipocytes is going to be dependent upon the body region and gender. The actual size of these cells, the size of the fat cells, is going to be based on nutritional status and the activity level. And you got a lot of fat or a little fat uh, within these regions. And that finishes up our discussion of the dermis and hypodermis. Uh, well, next series of lectures, part four, we're going to talk about uh, ancillary structures or uh, specialized structures associated with the skin. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.